ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce my 52 assistants. Notice the contrast of style and character. They range from ingratiating simplicity to regal splendor. Some are passive and inert, others brazen and belligerent, some suicidal, <laughs> just like you and me. But card artistry, just like other theatrical forms, music and dance, has its own styles, its own classics, its own genres. I'm going to start my show tonight by doing the same effect in three different ways. First, in the flashy American style you'll all remember from the 1970s. <laughs> Well, on my way to the luckiest night of my life. <laughs> now the same effect as you might have seen it performed by a European. Ooh. An old meter's tune, Just Kissed My Baby, going back for number two. Think about how much better this might look with a frilly shirt or a bow tie. <laughs> Think about how much better I might look. <laughs> now the same effect as you might have seen it performed in a drawing room very much like this one at the turn of the century. Ladies and gentlemen, I shall endeavor to illustrate and show how futile are the attempts of plebeians to enter that select circle of society known as the beau monde, and indeed to show how such entree is prevented by the polite yet frigid exclusiveness of its gentler members. <laughs> Let us assume it is the occasion of a public reception. Our table, the hall, our deck, the common herd, and we would fittingly select the four queens as representing the feminine portion of the smart set. Now, as would naturally be the case, I shall besiege these high-strung patrician ladies with attentions from the lower orders, which these next 12 cards shall represent. I shall start by placing one, two, three commoners on Her Majesty the Queen of Hearts, the next three outsiders on the Queen of Diamonds. And though the mention or notice of all these suitors is equally abhorrent to the grand dames, I shall treat them alike by placing on the Queen of Spades one, two, three more rank outsiders. Finally, the last three who have been closest to the bottom, therefore least crowding and most deserving to proffer their homage on the Queen of Clubs. Ladies and gentlemen, as you have seen, I have brutally taken advantage of these tenderly nurtured and unsophisticated young creatures by placing them in positions which must be extremely galling to their aristocratic sensibilities. Can they endure? Can they endure? Yes. 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 Indeed they can. Having some knowledge of the marvelous subtlety, resources, and finesse of the sex, I feel confident these women can, with tact and discretion, easily elude their persecutors and form a more congenial coterie amongst themselves. Watch first the Queen of Clubs. Watch her as she turns her back on the suitors and then goes to Windsor for the weekend. <laughs> Next, the queen of spades, slightly more daring than the others, tantalizes the men, Gucci, Gucci, goo, amidst their consternation, makes good her escape. The queen of diamonds knows the aphorism, it's easiest to disappear in a crowd. Now you see her. And alas, now you do not. Or, as I suggested only a moment ago, is it possible these women could seek out each other's company? <laughs> the fatal vanity of the sex could prove me correct. That's one, that's two, that's three. And that's two. and the blow-ins cop the lot. Anybody have any idea what I'm talking about? <laughs> this is the refrain from a 15th century poem, a poem by Francois Villon. It says, no matter how you earn your money, you're unlikely to keep it, whether you hustle or swindle or con or cheat, because in the end, booze and the blow-ins, wine and women, take it all.
Suppose you screeve or go cheap jack or fake the broads or fig and egg or thimble rig or nap a yak or pitch a snide or smash a rag. Suppose you duff or nose and lag or get your straight and land the pot. How do you melt the multi swag? Booze and the blowins cop the lot. Suppose you try a different tack and on the square you flash your flag. At a penny lining make your whack or with the mummers mump and gag. For nicks, for nicks, the dibs you grab at any graft, no matter what. Your merry goblins soon stravag. Booze and the blowins cop the lot. It's up the spout and Charlie wag with the wipes and tickers and whatnot until the squeezer grabs your scrag. Booze and the blowins cop the lot. This is William Henley's 19th century translation of Villon, rich in the canting language, the criminal slang of its day. It talks about debasers of coin, short change artists, dice mechanics, card hustlers. These people are my friends. <laughs> I spent most of my formative years learning the techniques of deception. Now, many years later, I can tell you that I believe there are more differences between the cheater and the sleight of hand artist than there are similarities. Uh, take, for example, an evening like this. If I perform badly, I might suffer the disapprobation of the audience or an empty house. If I perform equally poorly at the card table, I could suffer loss of limb or even life. <laughs> Notwithstanding, I would like to demonstrate art, ruse, and subterfuge at the card table. To do this, I have to be sure there are a number amongst you who are familiar with the basic laws of poker, blackjack, gin rummy. Do we have any serious card players in the house? Well, thanks. It's been fun performing for you. <laughs> you play some cards on a fairly serious level? Great. Can I induce you to help me for a moment? And I need somebody else as well, a card player? Someone to come up? No harm will come. Uh, fine, if you can get out, you can get in. Uh, would you have a, a chair? Uh, you can drop the joker and leave that at your seat. That would only be confusing. And uh, this gentleman has found the outside aisle, which is also good. Please be my guest. Your first name is? Jeff. Jeff, Ricky. Appreciate Larry. you coming up. And you are? Larry. Larry, still Ricky. Still Ricky. <laughs> so Jeff and Larry have been kind enough to join me for what will be a brief philosophical discussion on the nature of cheating. Uh, Jeff, Larry, let me pose a scenario to you, gentlemen. If I said to you these cards were marked, they are not. But if I said they were marked, visualize that, and we played with these cards and I subsequently won a lot of money from you, would you be more inclined, uh, uh, Jeff, to call me a hustler, a cheater, or someone taking advantage? Which of those three terms? Mm, cheater. Cheater. And uh, Larry? Cheater. And I would say a cheater. I, I think we have no problem with agreement on this particular issue. <laughs> let's try another scenario. Uh, <laughs> let's say we're playing pool instead of cards. <laughs> let's say I was capable of running 30 or 40 balls every time I addressed the table. You gentlemen could run three or four. We played games to 100 points. We played for a lot of money. Not only did I win, but I won 100 to 96, 100 to 99, 100 to 98. What term do you think would apply there? Hustler. <laughs> no disagreement from me. You've all seen that movie with Paul Newman, haven't you, The Hustler? It's a classic. I mean, and why is that? Because it's a specific situation. It's a man who's staying in a game longer, playing less well than he can to keep his opponents there longer to win more money. Pool players call it playing under speed. Well, is that ever applicable at the card table? Well, perhaps. What if we were playing poker, and at the end of an evening, I owed each of you gentlemen $80, and we decided we'd cut high card, double or nothing, winner take all. <laughs> and you cut a queen, and I cut an ace. And you cut a nine, and I cut an ace. And you cut a 10, and I cut an ace. <laughs> well, I have a sense this wouldn't last for very long, which is kind of the point. So what if we were in a situation where I was trying to subtly beat you rather than to beat you badly? Uh, in this case, Jeff, what I want you to do is reach into the deck anywhere at all. Just pick up a group of cards like that. Could be high, low, in the center, and we'll see what's on the bottom of your hand there. You mind turning it over? That's a king. Show that to the audience. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't allow much room for subtlety. Uh, <laughs> it's possible to beat you, but the only way I could by cutting an ace, I can, but let's move on. So the idea here is really to do something that's slightly different. Um, so, Jeff, what I want you to do is, uh, uh, Larry. What I want you to do is just pick up a group of cards anywhere at all, yourself, and let's see what you've cut to. Take a look. What is that? A two, which is indeed why you've been invited here this evening. <laughs> <laughs> well, not necessarily. I mean, I could cut a two as well. <laughs> but, here's the idea. If I wanted to keep you around, uh, I might want to tempt the fates by just beating you. What do I mean? What if I could uh, cut a three to just eke out a victory over your two? I can. 
<laughs> and, and that's sort of the point that I was talking about. Now, I have to confess, if we were playing for $80, I might want to cut a three to beat a two. If we were playing for thousands, I might want to try to get an ace. So you gentlemen are really the eyes of the audience. I want you to watch me very closely as I do what should be good, solid riffle shuffles, something that you would be happy to see within the course of your own game. Uh, I'm going to give them one more and then do what gamblers call a dead cut, which is literally trying to let my hands reach the deck and cut an ace. This is an acquired skill. <laughs> and once again, please notice that there are no breaks or protrusions in the deck. There are no dog ears. Uh, I'm going to take the deck. I'm going to divide it very cleanly in half. I really am going to solidly shuffle the cards. And once again, I'm going to try to do what's called dead cutting an ace, to reach down into this part of the deck and cut out another ace. And by the way, notice if I cut even one card uh, too few or one card too many, I would have not have cut an ace. By the way, this is also something I practice left-handed. That's in case someone breaks my right thumb. So <laughs> let me try to cut the ace of spades for you. Left-handed, oh, lucky me. Now, those of you who follow the game would understand that each time I cut an ace, it's so much harder for me to cut the next one. This has something to do with the law of probability. <laughs> so anyway, that's the concept. And once again, gentlemen, I'm going to ask you to watch me narrowly as I shuffle the cards. And Jeff, I'm going to give the deck some cuts. At any point while I'm cutting, would you say stop? Stop. That's good. Be my guest. <laughs> Put it on the table. You gentlemen have been doing very well. Uh, can I induce you to stay for the postgraduate uh, lecture here? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, tonight I've chosen three topics for discussion. Uh, first, card control, what happens when cards are shuffled and cut. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little about false dealing. You've heard the term dealing from the bottom of the deck, probably. I'm going to discuss that. Then maybe end up with a demonstration of card stacking. Uh, but first, can cards be controlled? Well, yes. So I, I'm going to... <laughs> I'm going to demonstrate how this actually might look. This is very strange. This is really a gambler's exercise. It's something that's distinctly non-theatrical in tone, uh, but I hope you'd find it intriguing. So what I'm going to do, and again, these gentlemen are close by, they can see that I'm putting aces in the center of groups of cards at random, and then they are, at least for this second, out of my control. And what does that mean? It means it's an exercise in isolation, so there are many cards in between each ace. And yet, when I push them into the deck, I don't leave them protruding by a sixteenth of an inch or a thirty-second of an inch. At least for the moment, the aces are out of my control. I mean, they're squared and they're in the center. They're not sticking out. How do I get them back in my control? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. I get them in my control by shuffling. How do I shuffle the cards? Well, this is a complex issue. If I were a cheat, I would want to shuffle the cards in a way so I did not seem more clever or less clever than anyone else in the game. Uh, let's say we were playing gin in Miami Beach and people shuffled in the old-fashioned way like this, then that's the way I would want to shuffle cards. If we were in a rather elegant New York uh, bridge parlor, you might see someone shuffle the cards in this way and then do a little bridge afterwards. That's what that's called, a little flourish. But it's a simple riffle shuffle. If you're uh, in Las Vegas, you wouldn't be allowed to shuffle cards like that. A pit boss would actually say to you, you must shuffle cards with them flat on the surface of the table. Why? They're afraid that if you put the cards in your hand, I could glimpse them or you could glimpse them. So this way, it's much more procedurally cautious for them. You would actually shuffle the cards like that. Then I'm sure you've all been to private games where people turn half the cards over and talk about, you know, anaconda, pass the garbage, uh, Alaskan <laughs> poker. And in this case, they're literally shuffling face-up cards into face-down cards like this, uh, leaving a distinct mess of cards from various positions. Well, what does a cheat do? Well, I can't speak for everyone, but I can tell you I've done this long enough that I can make three statements of absolute fact about the condition of the cards at this very moment. The first statement is, even though the aces were widely separated after all that shuffling, they are now together, one next to the other. The second statement is they're in the dead center of the deck. The third statement is to make it easier for you to see them, I've straightened out every other card, so only the four <laughs> aces are face up. <laughs> So that's an example of card control, albeit a flamboyant example, but nevertheless. So how do you deal with this in a real situation? Let's say we're in Miami Beach, we give an overhand shuffle, we're now going to play some gin rummy. And now this should look serious and above board. Two hands of ten card gin. 
turn over a knock card. Do you play a little gin? Good. What I've tried to do is deal my opponent a solid gin hand, but more than 30 unmatched points. So take a look with me and see if we've been successful. And you can see that there's a meld here and a meld here, but two kings and a 10 and a three. That would be 33 unmatched points. I, I know this is a little technical for some of you. If you don't play gin, by the way, this is gin. That's the 987 of Gotman, 5555, and the 8766 of Space. Uh, I, I, I win. So, uh, let's try some 21. I'm sure you play a little blackjack. Now, remember, if we're going to play 21, you're going to see me shuffling like you would in a Vegas casino. You'd see these strip cuts. I'm going to be like the house, which means I'm going to stand on 17 but hit on 16. You can make any choice you want. I'll, I'll even show you what I have. Uh, I'll. Stand. You're going to stand, okay. Uh, you have 18. I have 16, so I have to draw. So I'd be looking for a, um, well, a five would make 21. Just like Vegas, huh? <laughs> so that's 21, sorry. Um, <laughs> let's try another one. Um, you could split on fives, but it's much better to double down if you happen to have a pair of fives, Larry. So, um, <laughs> so that'd be 17 for you. And I won't get 21 every time. I have 8 and 5 or 13, and 6 would be 19 enough to eke out a minor victory. Uh, let's try one more over here. Oh, I'm sorry, I gave you three. Yeah, well, some, casino, okay. some casinos let you double down on a three-card 11. Oh, I'll double down. Yeah, that's not a bad bet. <laughs> let's see, that's 17 again, and I have uh, 10 and 4, 14, so I'd have bust, to draw. Bust, bust, bust. <laughs> oh, grow up. 21. So, yeah, I'm sorry to do this to you. I, I, I always tell you they're sorry in Vegas, too. I mean, a, now, look, if these cards aren't marked, and I, I tell you they're not, I mean, I don't know if you're going to believe me, but they're not, how does somebody do this? I, I, I think there are two things at play here. One is I have a, a, a very good memory, and the other is I, I kind of know what happens when cards are shuffled. Well, what does this mean? It means while we were playing Jin, while we were playing 21, I was trying to remember where the aces were and leave them at various portions of the deck where I could find them. That's two, 31 down, three. And if I can go left-handed, uh, let's see, that's four. That's card control. <laughs> well, move on to the uh, second phase here. I did tell you that I talk a little about false dealing. You've heard the term bottom dealing. Second dealing, is that something you've heard of? Yeah, you too as well, Larry? You guys have been around the block. Um, here's the way this works. Uh, if I had the ace of spades on top of the deck and we were playing in a game, I'd want to deal that card to Larry unless I didn't, which means that I wouldn't deal him the top card. I'd make it look like I was dealing him the top card, but I would be keeping it on the top. That's why it's called second dealing. It's an odd concept. It looks like the top card is coming off the deck, but in fact it isn't. So this is something uh, that one could do, and um, this requires practice. <laughs> now, bottom dealing, some people say, is even a little more difficult. In this case, you'd place four aces on the bottom of the deck. And again, I want you to see that this is not an optical illusion. The aces really are on the bottom. What I'm going to be doing here, this works with five or six hands in the game. But in this case, I'm going to deal my opponents a card and myself a card. His cards come off the top. My cards come off the bottom. This is cheating. <laughs> Now, the most elaborate form of false dealing is uh, something called center dealing. This was literally unheard of 70, 70 years ago. It, it's almost never been seen. And we'll I'll actually tell you about its origins. In, in 1933, uh, two men who I believe were the greatest card handlers in America, a man named Charlie Miller, who is living in El Paso, Texas, and a man named Di Vernon, a Canadian living then in New York, received a phone call from a mutual friend. And this guy said, there's a fellow out here in Wichita who can deal from the center of the deck. These two men hung up the phones, packed their bags, and left for Wichita. Well, what made two grown men travel so fast and so far? Uh, I'll try to explain in layman's terms. If I were going to deal four aces from the bottom of the deck in any normal game, bridge or gin or canasta or poker, I would ask the person on my, life, on my right, in this case Jeff, to cut the cards. So if the aces were on the bottom, you would be cutting them into the middle. So before I could deal them from the bottom, I would somehow have to nullify your cut. Now, this is possible. I could do the hop, the pass, the shift, saute, la coupe. But these are difficult maneuvers. And they're especially difficult because everyone's staring at your hands at that important part of the game. If instead I could leave the four aces anywhere in the deck and deal them by feel, this would be an enormous advantage. And that's why Charlie Miller and Vernon went to Wichita. And they knew the name of the man they were looking for was Alan Kennedy. But they didn't know where he lived. So they went to gambling joints, pool halls, bowling alleys. They wound up having a very frustrating week. And they were actually unable to find him. They were packing their cars to go home when Vernon noticed a little girl eating an ice cream cone with obvious pleasure. 
and she tripped and it fell to the ground. And, and being a gallant soul, he gave her a nickel and she came back with another cone, smiling. And he said, little girl, do you know a man named Alan Kennedy? And the girl said, sure, mister, he lives up the road a block and a half. And that's how they found Kennedy and saw the center deal. And Vernon loved to tell the story when he was in his 80s. He'd always kind of lean back and say, yes, and a little child shall lead them. <laughs> so with that thought in mind, a demonstration of the deal. Uh, you can see what I'm doing may look odd in one sense because I'm putting the aces in the deck face up. Why am I doing that? Because it's a demonstration. If we were in a real poker game, obviously the aces would be face down, but this is a case where I want you to see me cheating. Uh, and what I'm going to do is give a little shuffle and then try to sense where those aces are as I deal them. There shouldn't be any uh, directly near the top or near the bottom. Let's say we're playing four hand. We'll make it five, a little more theatrical. I would be dealing out five hands and I'd be trying to get the ace in my hand. Now you could see there was no ace on the top. So in that split second, I choose not to take the top card and somehow dig below the deck to where I feel an ace. You see if I can do that one more time and one more. And if I can, that would be false dealer. Well, as you uh, George Bernard Shaw fans know, he said, every profession is a conspiracy against the laity. Jeff, I want to thank you very much for helping. Larry, a nice hand for these fellows. Thanks so much. Uh, I should point out that it's actually very difficult to come up under the hot lights and make rational card playing decisions. I, I thank you both very much indeed. Uh, in the course of that demonstration, I mentioned two people who had a profound influence on my life. Uh, Charlie Miller and Di Vernon. They both died just a couple of years ago. Charlie was 80, Vernon was 98. The reason that I moved to Los Angeles more than 20 years ago was to spend what I thought would be a few years with these men, and it turned out to be two decades. And not only did I have the great pleasure of watching them perform, they also would regale me with stories of the sleight of hand artists that they saw when they were younger. And I think the name that was mentioned more than any other was the name of Max Molini. Molini was born in Austria-Hungary in 1873. He immigrated to the United States, to New York, as a small boy and began to make his living, he showed great promise with sleight of hand, uh, by busking in the most notorious bars along the Bowery, literally passing a hat for nickels and dimes. And he got so good at this that he was ready to branch out. And in 1902, uh, he went to Washington, D.C. He had no advanced bookings, uh, but as luck would have it, the first day he was in the Capitol, he noticed Mark Hanna on the steps of Congress, very prominent senator of the day. There was much less security than there is now, and he literally ran up to Mark Hanna and, and suddenly uh, swooped down and bit a button off his suit coat. And before people could grab him and take him away, he made one of those magical passes, and when the senator looked down, the button was now sewn back perfectly in place. So instead of being arrested as a lunatic, he received a lucrative engagement, and his career was made. <laughs> But since this show is devoted to playing cards, I'm going to show you uh, a concept that Molini invented around the turn of the century. And the idea here was that more than one person would take a card during the course of an effect. So I'm actually going to step into the audience. You don't have to join me on stage. And I'm going to ask a number of people to take cards. Uh, if for some reason you don't want to help, that's fine. If you do, that would be great. Uh, I'll ask the woman on the end. Uh, you don't have to get up. But if you just say uh, stop at some point when I uh, put these in front of you, and if you'd actually look at that card and try to remember it. I'm going to ask the gentleman next to you to remember it as well. Otherwise, I'd have an effect with no plot. So you will uh, remember that card. And as a gentleman with a mustache, would you also say stop for me? Stop. OK, and that's one for you. Good. And uh, well, you've done yeoman's work already, Larry. The woman sitting next to you, if you don't mind, would you say stop? Stop. Good. That's one for you. And if you'd help try to remember that. Uh, and perhaps this gentleman with the tie, thank you. Stop. Good. One for you. And uh, the gentleman on the aisle. Uh, this one or the next one? Uh, the next one. The next one. That's fine. So I've had a number of cards selected. Um, I was just thinking that uh, also a pleasure living in Southern California is I've gotten to know Ozzie Malini. This is Max Malini's son who's now a retired businessman. And uh, a while ago he told me a story about his uh, father that I'll share with you. It seems that many years ago uh, Malini was asked to perform for Governor Brown of the Philippines. And Governor Brown, knowing that Malini was Jewish, decided to play a joke on him. And at a very important dinner, he served him an enormous roast pig with an apple in its mouth. And uh, Malini looked at this pig uncomfortably for some time and then took out his table napkin and covered it. He paused for the requisite dramatic moment, whisked the napkin aside, the pig had completely vanished and the cooked chicken was in its place. <laughs>
Uh, fortunately for me, this, uh, this show is devoted to playing cards, so I'm not obligated to conjure with poultry. <laughs> Which means that I have to ask you to take a card, that's all I do in life. So would you be so kind as to just say, stop at some point? Okay. And if you'd remember that and the gentleman behind you would help, would you remember that card as well? And if I can ask this gentleman to also say stop for me? Stop. Okay. That's one for you and the gentleman next to you, if I can get you to say stop. 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 Good. Please remember that one and, and you as well. Yes? Stop. Good. I think that's enough. Well, I shouldn't prejudice rows a, a further back than the first. I see a gentleman with a tie in the second row. Can I also get you to say stop? Stop. Okay. And one for you, a firm stoppage, I might add. Uh, so I've had, I don't know, 11 or 12 cards selected. Uh, I'm going to shuffle the cards and try to find those cards again. Actually, I have to confess at this point during the show every evening, I wonder what it would be like if I didn't find those cards. <laughs> Just a thought. So, uh, the woman on the end, if I can get you to actually mention your card out loud. The Eight of Hearts, I'm going to try to find it in mid-shuffle. That sounds odd, but look, one card has stopped halfway in the shuffle deck, and fortunately, at least for me, uh, that is the Eight of Hearts. Let's see, who took the next card? Would you be so kind? Seven of Hearts. The Seven of Hearts. <laughs> Good. Was yours still possible again? Would you mention it? Six of spades. Six of spades. We're going to try to get the deck to sort of shoot out and cut itself right at your card, which is the six of spades. And uh, yours, sir? Seven of diamonds. The seven of diamonds from the six to the seven of diamonds. And the gentleman on the end? Ten of spades. The ten of spades. We're going to find the next card by means of a simple cut. <laughs> and that is the ace of clubs, the card the woman on the aisle took, your ace of clubs. Your card was, you're shaking your head now? No. Ace of clubs? What was it? Four of diamonds. If you insist. <laughs> I'm looking for a little sympathy, you give me nothing. Play the chill for me. Icy. <laughs> Uh, you, you, you took one, uh, I believe. Would you be so kind as, uh, as to mention it for me? Jack of Diamonds. Jack of Diamonds out of the deck into my hand as if propelled. Uh, oh. uh, uh, Jack of Diamonds. I'm going to try to find yours in the South American or Carioca fashion, if you'd be so kind as to name it. Ace of Hearts. The Ace of Hearts. Let's see. Oh. Good. Uh, <laughs> You haven't forgotten yours, I trust. What was that? Nine of clubs. The nine of clubs, the last card. Yeah, you didn't take one, did you? Were you? Oh, oh, in the second row. What, what was yours, sir? Six of diamonds. Six of diamonds. Well, I'll have to find both of them. Nine of, cl nine of clubs, six of diamonds. <laughs> your nine of clubs, your six of diamonds. <laughs> How many of you are interested in astrology? Well, there's the rousing response I was hoping for. <laughs> I read in the newspapers that 71% of Americans read their horoscope. How come none of them ever come to the theater? <laughs> I just made that up. <laughs> you occasionally look at your horoscope? I only claim to be 90% correct, madam. Uh, can I induce you to help me for a brief moment? Thank you. You'd have to have a chair. <laughs> Watch your step, please. Thanks, and if you uh, would sit over there for me. Uh, I have to confess, uh, that's perfect, that even when I do uh, astrological experiments, I also use playing cards. There's a surprise. So if, uh, if you'd be kind enough to examine them for me, take a good look at them, and when you think they're okay, you can kind of spread them face down on the table, and uh, please do that, and then slide out a card uh, from the middle somewhere. Uh, that will be your card. Don't show it to me. I would like you, however, to write your name on it. Do you have a felt-tip pen? I do. <laughs> so, 
I'm going to turn around. When I do, I want you to write your card, not on this side of the card, your name, but on the other side. Just your first name and very large letters would be helpful, okay? Uh, and then uh, I'm going to ask you some questions, and based on the astrological significance of those answers, I'm going to determine something about something. <laughs> Have you done that uh, so far? Almost. Almost. Take your time. Good. May I have the pen back? I'm not a wealthy man. All right. Um, so the first of the many questions I'm going to ask you is to tell me the date of the month you were born on, but don't answer just yet. May I have the card? Uh, I'm going to ask you for the date of the month, which means I don't want the year, and I oddly enough don't even want the month. So if you were born on the 15th of March, you'd say 15. So what date would that be? Nine. Nine. So that means you have to make 14 piles with the cards quickly. Uh, would you do that? Because 14 equals nine in the mysterious triangle of Eichlon. <laughs> Quickly, though, this is dead time. No, you're doing very well. I, you're doing well, but just keep moving. So, uh, <laughs> all right. Were you born in uh, in January? No. No. How many piles do you have here? Um, eleven. Eleven. Well, twelve is just perfect. So, uh, <laughs> you weren't born in January. Take away any two piles quickly. Good. Were you born in March? No. Take away one pile. Were you born in February? Take away two piles. Were you born east of the Mississippi? Uh, it's a maybe, take away three piles. <laughs> How many piles do you see on the table? Four. Take away any pile now. Yet, mysteriously, four piles remain. <laughs> do you read the classics? Mm. Take away one pile. <laughs> Who killed Laura Palmer? <laughs> take away three piles. Were you born under a picture of Balzac? In that case, take away four cards. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, by a strange process of elimination so peculiar, I myself am amazed. <laughs> We're left with one card and my favorite phrase, one card only. <laughs> For the first time, would you mention the card you selected? Space. With your name on it, the... Uh, that's okay, I had no intention of finding your card. Uh, that would be much too easy. <laughs> but you are in luck, because I have the only mind-reading toucan in the world. The toucan will find your card. We'll go into the center of these cards and we'll find one card. We'll narrow it down and find one card. Contact, yes, right there, your card, the king, the king? Is your signature there? No. Nope. Why not? <laughs> oh, a different thing. Oh, I'm sorry. The, uh, this hippopotamus head will find your card. This hippopotamus head will move around and find your card. <laughs> Look at that. Using the famous key measurement system. Yes? No, I'll take that back. That's a no. In this case, this snail will find your card. The snail will actually push out a card. It's going to go somewhere here, moving as snails do. A predator snail, moving as they do. Look at that. Look at that. He's eating. Yes, absolutely no. That's a no. All right. So this turtle with the human head will find your card. Yes? No, that's a no. All right. This rabbit... This rabbit will find your card or die. <laughs> would you be surprised if your card was in this can of peanut brittle? So would I. I've been doing this since I was four. Never once. As the Ladies and gentlemen, there comes a time in every strange person's life when he must get serious. For me, that time is at hand. <laughs> Look, here is a case that I have not opened in a month. <laughs> Inside, one brand new sealed pack of cards.
Is your name by, by any chance Aaron? I would take this as a very good sign. <laughs> and is that your name on the King of Spades? That's it. Thanks so much. If I could go back in history, and I can, <laughs> the performer I would most like to see would be Johann Nepomuk Hofzinser, the famous Viennese card magician who charmed Victorian Vienna. Um, do you mind if I ask you to shuffle these cards as I chat for a moment? Dr. Hofzinser opened up a wonderful theater in Vienna. I actually have a card de visite of the doctor here. Uh, you can see that he's in a rather strange Napoleonic pose. Um, uh, I'm going to ask you to hold this, but gently, it's one of my prized possessions. And if I can also uh, get the cards back from you. Hofzinser opened up a theater in the mid-years of the 19th century in Vienna, and he charged 20 golden ducats for admission. That's more than a common laborer earned in a year, just to see sleight of hand in a theater about a third of the size that we're in. <coughs> Since you were also kind enough to shuffle, would you uh, say stop at some point while I'm moving these cards like this? Okay, that's fine. I'm going to ask you to take that card in your own hand and show it up to a number of people. Uh, in 1851, at a state dinner, Dr. Hofzinser was present, and also at this particular dinner was a beautiful woman that none of the other diners had ever seen. And someone sitting next to her said, my dear, you have lovely teeth. And the woman said, thank you, let me show them to you. <laughs> and she called for a goblet, and one by one took the teeth out of her mouth and placed them in a glass, which was then circulated to the rather confounded diners. <laughs> At one point, the glass wound up in front of Dr. Hofzinser. He covered it for an instant with his hand. When he lowered his hand, the teeth had vanished from the glass. He pointed to the woman who, with a dazzling smile, showed that they had returned to her mouth. It was in that way that he introduced his wife, Wilhelmina, to polite Viennese society. <laughs> Hofzinser asked for all his props and effects to be destroyed at the end of his life. He thought he had no worthy successors, and if not for a German lawyer named Otto Karfischer, this would have happened. But Otto Karfischer painstakingly tracked down the early students of Hofzinser, a man named George Hoybeck, another named Karl von Papaschel, and collected the material in this volume. So it's really because of Otto Karfischer that I'm able to perform for you my favorite of his many experiments, one which uh, Dr. Hofzinser called Everywhere and Nowhere. Can I see the uh, hands of the gentleman who selected the card, please? Ah, in the second row. And uh, actually, I'm going to give you some cards and ask you to return it somewhere in this portion. Don't let me see it. And give them one final cut or shuffle if you'd like. And also to drop that, uh, to drop that here. Fine. And uh, I actually am going to take the card de visite from you as well. And I must also confess that I use this photograph of Dr. Hofzinser in the proceedings. It makes it much harder to do this under the rather baleful glare of the doctor but it shouldn't affect your enjoyment in one way or the other. So, uh, if the gentleman would concentrate on the card, don't say anything, but do concentrate. Well, I'm going to make a definite statement here. Your card is one of these three. Apparently not the rousing denouement you were hoping for. <laughs> well, what would Dr. Hofzinser do in this situation? Well, he said that the most powerful magic on the earth was the power of a woman's gaze. So I'm going to ask that gentleman to point to a woman close by you who from their seat in the audience can help me complete the experiment. Would you do that for me? You're gesturing to the person at your side. For the benefit of those behind you who can't see your gaze, with your voice, would you identify for me, select one of the cards closest in the center or furthest away, any one of those three? The center. And I'm going to ask you to stare at that card, and I'm telling you, if you do, it must be the card selected by the gentleman. So would you stare at the center card? Thank you. And you, sir, would you name the card which you selected? Two of clubs. Good. This is the two of clubs. from your reaction that you're somehow unrequited. Perhaps it was the power of my statement. Maybe you want me to take this a step further. So I will. I'm going to ask the woman now to change 
uh, and select the card either closest to me or furthest away. Would you designate one of those two? Closest to me. Closest to me. And would you stare at that card? Because if you do, then this card would have to become the two of clubs, <laughs> the plot thickens. Now, there is one other option that we could talk about, and perhaps we will. Uh, I'm going to ask you to stare at the card which is in my hand. If you don't mind doing that for me, would you? Thank you, because that is now the two of plot. But for just a second, avert your gaze. Literally look away from the card. Just look away for a second, because if you do, it could no longer be the two of clubs. You see, and if you look away again, please do, this card could not be the two of clubs. And if once again you look away, this could not be the two of clubs. <laughs> so you've witnessed an experiment from the 19th century, an experiment called Everywhere and Nowhere. that I throw playing cards further than anyone in the world, thank you very much. <laughs> I'd like to demonstrate my unusual skill for you this evening, but unfortunately, this theater is much too small. <laughs> Consequently, all I can really do is speak about the advantages of cards over more conventional weaponry. First, they're inexpensive. Secondly, if you're good with them, you can make a small fortune before the actual attack. <laughs> Third, there have been no convictions for carrying cards as a concealed weapon. <laughs> if you are, for instance, attacked by a door, you could kill the door, <laughs> but I know what you're saying. You're saying, sure, this man throws cards with incredible speed and uncanny accuracy, but can he throw a card and have that card return to his hand a simulacrum of the Australian boomerang? <laughs> but I know what you're saying. You're saying, sure, this man can throw cards and have them return to his hand, a simulacrum of the Australian boomerang. But can he, upon that card's return, cut it neatly in half with a pair of giant scissors? <laughs> yes, he can. Does anyone here have a pair of giant scissors? I do. And I might add, I feel so much better now. So here's how this works. I throw it out, the card comes back, I cut it and I should point out, if you're attacked by a pair of giant scissors, you may throw the card at the scissors, disabling the scissors completely. <laughs> but for those of you who prefer skill to verbiage, apparently all of you, I will throw the card in the air and upon its return, cut it neatly in half with a pair of giant scissors. Cut it neatly in half. Oh, wow. okay. Quad erat demonstrandum. <laughs> I will, however, go sans scabbard for the remainder of the show. Or as the Elizabethans say, go bare. <laughs> but I know what you're saying. You're saying, sure, this man can cut cards neatly in half with a pair of giant scissors, but can he defend himself against plastic? This seemingly mild-mannered plastic duck, once on an otherwise festive night in Rio, took a small portion of my anatomy home with him. I keep him around as a reminder of how difficult life on the road can be. <laughs> if you're attacked by a plastic duck, I suggest three methods of self-defense. First, the stare. <laughs> this angers the duck. <laughs> Next, the bold gesture. <laughs> this infuriates the beast. <laughs> Finally, I suggest firing a card at the duck. Yats! <laughs> this kills the duck and serves as a healthy reminder to would-be hecklers. <laughs> 
you're attacked by an animal band or a band of animals, fire. <laughs> They're saying, sure, this man can defend himself against plastic. Can he defend himself against fruit? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I will not waste your time with complex pears or prunes. No, 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 no. <laughs> you guessed it, the most prodigious of household fruits, His Majesty, the watermelon. Out of season and dreadfully expensive. <laughs> <laughs> this evening, I will attempt to penetrate the rich red interior of said melon with a few perfectly placed tosses from the ordinary pack. that my last two shots have landed in exactly the same slit in the watermelon. Oh a feat so impressive, uh. I am forced to mention it myself. <laughs> no doubt the last time you saw this done was when Errol Flynn did it in Robin Hood. <laughs> Understand that I could continue throwing cards in the same slit in the melon all night long, but I'm forced to stop because it's too much fun for the melon. <laughs> <laughs> but I know what you're saying. You're saying, sure, this man can throw cards into the rich red interior of said melon. Can he penetrate the even thicker pachydermatis outer melon layer? Yes. No. <laughs> Who the hell could do that? <laughs> but, encouraged by your approbation, I could attempt to penetrate the even thicker, hockey dramatic outer melon layer. Watch me work. <laughs> this scares the melon. <laughs> This wounds the melon. <laughs> this pisses me <laughs> off. You know, until Johann Nepomuk Hofzinser called Playing Cards the Poetry of Magic. A conjurer's skill was determined entirely on his ability to perform one effect. That was called the cups and balls. There are many people who will tell you it's the oldest effect in the history of magic. And on the tombs of the King Beni Hassan of ancient Egypt, there are representations of Nile magicians doing the cups and balls. I'm not one of those people. <laughs> I will tell you the game was known to the Greeks and Romans that Seneca wrote about it that the earliest iconography in our venerable art, the famous planetary drawings of Ulm in the 15th century, do show cups and balls conjurers. The game has been played continuously for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. With your kind permission, I'd like to end my performance this evening by showing you my version of this classic, which I call the history lesson. In 1584, Reginald Scott wrote the first practical treatise on conjuring in the English language. And then he spoke about putting a ball under a common object, like a uh, candlestick. 
He also said one might use a salt cellar, a bowl, or even a cup, and if the conjurer was clever, he could make the ball vanish and appear almost at will. Only a short time later, the game was played with bowls of china, played in the Orient. Anthropologists love the concept of independent invention. In Western Europe, it was played with cups of cheap metal, like tin, which on occasion had the strange ability to seem uh, penetrable. <laughs> this evening, I'm going to use cups of spun copper, personal favorites for a reason I will not reveal. <laughs> One of the things I love about this game is it independently exists in the genre of the gambler as well as the magician. This is a scene you may remember as the old three shell game. On the English race course, it was called thimble rigging. In the language of the hustler, it might be known as the hinks, the dinks, the blocks, or the nuts. The idea that you'd either put a ball or pretend to put a ball under one of the cups, but the ball would appear where it was least likely. Once again, if I place the ball over here and I move this, Moving these cups, you might think the ball was here, but it jumps to over here. One last time. This is why people have been known to lose houses and even clothing playing this little game. <laughs> One last time, if I place the ball here and move that to here, the ball now jumps as well. Now, a conjurer would do this in a slightly different fashion. The conjurer would take the object, put it in his hand, make it vanish using a magic wand. Conjurers also cheat. They use uh, many of them. Actually, the game was traditionally played with three cups and three balls. I'm going to show you an actual sequence of events from a 17th century bestseller called Hocus Pocus Jr. The idea here that I will cover the center ball with a cup and place one on top. Then I'll actually cover this and try to make the ball penetrate solid through solid, joining its mate below. Now that you know the sequence, why don't you follow it again? This time a ball penetrating through two solid copper cups. This method, a personal favorite of Matthew Buchinger, the little man of Nuremberg. He was only 28 inches tall. The cups obscured almost his entire body. <laughs> Look, that's enough for three balls to appear below. Matthew Buchinger had no arms or legs, but he did have 14 children. <laughs> the most famous man to ever play the game, the Italian Bartolomeo Bosco. Bosco appeared in the beginning of the 19th century, cut an unusual figure on stage. He wore a black satin waistcoat, black velvet trousers. He made sure his sleeves were carefully rolled up. He took out his magic wand and polished the tip, a wand which he said was made of a strange amalgam of metals known only to himself and Erasmus of Rotterdam. <laughs> Above his table was a brass bell. He hit the bell and said the words, Spirita mihi in fernali obedite, infernal spirits obey my command. Bosco sequence with the cups and the balls. Vade. Jubio. Celeriter. Three gone and yet three. Return. Bosco had only one contemporary rival, the slightly older Frenchman named Conus, who in 1795 announced that he would make his wife, who was five foot seven, appear under one of the cups. <laughs> Practice though I have, I have been unable even to get married. <laughs> wouldn't even touch these with his hand. Actually, he said the only reason a magician used three was to confuse you. So he took one ball and placed that aside in his pocket. He took the second ball and also placed that away. It still left one ball over here, but it didn't explain how this ball came back. <laughs> Conus explained it. He said the magician did a feint. He only pretended to take the ball. Actually, what he did was to pretend put his hand back, and then insinuate the ball under the cup. Conus said, I do no such thing. When I place the ball in my pocket, it really stays there. How could it come back, and indeed where? Perhaps back to the 16th century. Oh. Many of you may prefer the game the way it was played in the Orient, with two bowls, 
and two balls. Or you might prefer the European version with three cups and three balls. And if you have been paying attention, you know there would be one ball under the center cup, but now there are three. And that's the way the game was played for another 120 years until it was revolutionized once again by Max Molini, the man I spoke of earlier. Molini would take three glasses and wrap them in newspaper. He would take a cork from a wine bottle and cut it into three sections. He would take the three sections of cork and place them in his pocket. Then fashioning an impromptu wand out of a celery stalk or an asparagus spear, he would tap the glasses and say, spirit I in for nale obedite, or anything else that came to mind. <laughs> and that's the mystery of the cups.